All right, good morning. Welcome to the day with Trey. I'm your fill in host today, Omari Salisbury. I also joined with my good friend, colleague, co founder of Converge Media, Eric Calligraphy. What's happening, man? Man, good morning, man. Everything's happening. This is a beautiful day. <laughs> yeah, man, it's it's been a minute. I know people watching are like, what? <laughs> both, <laughs> both, both of these guys. This is this is man. It's been a lot. Um, you know, I used to have this whole routine so memorized. Let me, let me give it a second here. All right. Uh, <laughs> good morning. Welcome to the day with Trey. What it reminds you that right now is a perfect opportunity to tag and share the stream. Go ahead and tag and share the stream. The people you feel would appreciate culturally relevant news and information emanating from right here in the Emerald City. Also want to give a big shout out to our partner. <laughs> that was our thing. Huh? <laughs> We have too many to mention now. See, that's why I was on air. I was like, yeah, our partner here and there. But uh, <laughs> it, but it's a good thing, though, right? It's a you great know, thing. Listen, real. man, people love how we keep it real around here, right? Uh, but most importantly, though, uh, it's uh, a big shout out to man, our supporters. And All of our supporters. Yeah, it's a, it's a good feeling to, to be here today. And, you know, it's a, a very important conversation. And that's why you, you find me here. I mean, even though it's just always good to hang out with you, you know, we've yeah. got Dr. Eric Chow, and he's the chief of uh, communicable diseases in epidemiology at Public Health Seattle King County. You see, that was a mouthful. I remembered all of that. A <laughs> uh, real important conversation, man, about, about COVID and the COVID vaccines. And, you know, what I was saying um, before the show is that here in Seattle, um, you know, we're fortunate in a sense that a lot of us, especially a lot of Black people, we're in a bubble here. You know, we're, we were in the city that, you know, ranked number one amongst big cities as far as, like, you know, um, transmission and things like that. We were in a city where poor people were prioritized when it came, when it came first of all to, you know, to testing, if you remember, you know what I'm saying? And the chief Scoggins and those guys, they came with a plan to go to, to old folks homes and all those things first. And when the vaccine, you know, when the vaccine came out, you know, yeah, they, they went for poor people and for people who were at the highest risk. I remember somebody was joking that they were, they were like, man, am I going to get this vaccine or not? And by the way, I'm not, telling people to get vaccine or not vaccine, but you know what I'm saying? We'll, we'll let the, the, the good doctor speak to that. But it was like, man, I knew that vaccine must have been real when rich white people from the, uh, from the east side were trying to come over and get in line in Seattle at First A and B Church. They, 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 was, they was trying to go to First A and B and get, and get, get them a vaccine shot. Uh, so, But the whole, the whole point of what I'm saying is that we have a different vantage point than a lot of the rest of America where, where where black people and poor people weren't prioritized around testing or or around the vaccine, where you didn't have access to world-class health care here. You know, I mean, look at all these world-class um, hospitals that are here mm -hmm. ranging all the way for just, I, I was saying, just around the, the Central District, University yeah. of Washington, Swedish, Swedish, Virginia Mason, Harborview, you know what I'm saying, all, all right there. These are challenges that a lot of people and the rest of America didn't face. And for me, I went to a lot of COVID funerals and every single one of them was down South, yeah. South Carolina and places like that, where, you know, it was a different reality for black people. And so we're having a real important conversation later on here in the show about, man, what's going on with COVID. Because, yeah. you know, we all want to move on from this pandemic, man, but <laughs> COVID's still out there. Well, yeah, it's kind of interesting because a lot of people, it feels like it's over. But then it's not because you can look at the news and see different updates, right? But then 
when you're actually in neighborhoods or living life or you're going through life, people are like, ah, it's over. No mask, no vax talk. Don't cover your mouth, you know? <laughs> Man, <Depending>. hey, you <laughs> know, I'm going to tell you this. I'm hoping if nothing else, all you people who was never washing your hands before COVID, <laughs> if if you don't stick with anything else, man, please just keep washing your hands, dog. <laughs> it's amazing how many people hand washing wasn't really part of their routine. <laughs> yeah, that was, yeah, that was absolutely <laughs> amazing. Like, come on, man. Hey, hey, you can't leave you know, the bathroom, and just look, open the look, door. <laughs> You got you got people really mad. Like, like man, I gotta I gotta say happy birthday while washing my hands. Man, twenty seconds is a long time. Like, man, do you know what's living underneath your fingernails, bro? Yeah, <laughs> it's disgusting. <laughs> All right, so like I said, looking forward to that conversation. Um, but man, something that we just came came out today across all converged media platforms is Caesar Canizales, man. Caesar reports. Caesar was in the Central District and caught up with Maisha Barnett mm -hmm. and um, former King County Council member, Council President Larry Gossett. You know, Powell, Powell Barnett Park, yeah, yeah, right, right there near Garfield on MLK. Um, there's a proposal to put an off the leash dog park inside the park. And so, as you can imagine, you know, that park is very near and dear to not only the black community, but people who live in that area in the central district bordering, um, you know, all the you know, it's the CD. It's Let the me CD, not get yeah. too, you know what I'm saying? That's these Madison days. to Massachusetts, yeah, 31st. Yeah. You know what I'm <laughs> um, but even, even though, I guess what I'm trying to say, even though there's been a shift in, in demographics around their central district over the years, man, I mean, that is a place that, that, uh, we hold near and dear as a, overall as a community. And so Seattle Parks Department has done some kind of assessment and they're saying that Powell Barnett Park might be a great place to put an off the leash dog park. This, you know, um, anyways, Caesar went up there as usual. See, man, Caesar's known in the hood, man. <laughs> <laughs> He's on all, he all, all the stories in the hood. But um, here's Caesar reporting uh, from Powell Barnett Park. Powell Barnett Park in the Central District is a peaceful place that neighbors use for play, exercise, family gatherings, and more. But that tranquility could come to an end. Seattle Parks and Recreation is considering installing a fenced-in, off-leash dog park in an open, grassy section of the park, right next to a picnic area. It would completely destroy a perfectly good open and green space. Seattle Park says demand for off-leash dog parks has grown exponentially, so it conducted a study to determine where to build a new one. Powell Barnett Park is one of the locations in the Central District that Seattle Parks has identified as one that meets the agency's siting criteria. It was named after an African American in the city of Seattle. It's also uh, one of the oldest green spaces in the Central District and has served multiple generations over time. Maisha Barnett is the granddaughter of Paul Barnett, a civic activist and community advocate who received multiple commendations for his work in the community. The park was named after him in 1969. The park fell into disrepair over the years, but in 2006, Barnett raised funds to renovate the park, putting in new sod, benches, and exercise area. All the work was done in just six days. Barnett opposes putting an off-leash area in the park for a multitude of reasons. She cites safety, the environment, and the disruption that an off-leash area would bring. It would display several activities. There are multiple events that happen here, including carnivals, children playing, frisbee, football, soccer, family gatherings, church gatherings, school reunions. Besides, Barnett says, there is no need for an off-leash area because there's already a dog park just about a mile down the road, Blue Dog Pond. Some people who live near Powell Barnett, including former King County Council member Larry Gossett, oppose the plan. I think it's a terrible idea because it's one of the uh, historic parks in the central area that a lot of African-American families have uh, gotten significant enjoyment from. Bobby Forge says the park is a place where people come to relax, to enjoy picnics and commune. 
This is our health club. This is the place we come to recreate. This is the place we come to exercise. This is the place that we come for tranquility. Ravi Chandran hasn't been living in the neighborhood for very long, but he exercises at the park regularly. He says he's afraid of dogs and would prefer an off-leash park somewhere else. Uh, there should be an exclusive park for uh, dog ball pay, pitching game and because dogs also need some kind of uh, outlet time. Even people who like dogs oppose the plan. Hope Hensley is a friend of Maisha Barnett and has been informing neighbors about the potential of an off-leash area inside the park. She says most are opposed. Personally, I would find it disgusting to be next to a dog park. <laughs> and I like dogs. A dog owner who had his two dogs at the park did not want to appear on camera but he said he would be in favor of having an off-leash area at Powell Barnett for his dogs to play. Seattle Parks is defending an off-leash area inside Powell Barnett Park. In an email, the agency said an off-leash area is needed in the Central District in order to reduce conflicts at parks between residents and off-leash dogs and better mitigate the impacts of dogs on our natural environments. The organization acknowledged that the picnic area presented a conflict due to health and hygiene, and if Powell Barnett is selected, they would work with the community to relocate the picnic space within the park. Community members who want to comment on the off-leash plans should visit the Seattle Parks website at seattle.gov parks. The agency is also hosting listening sessions at the U District Farmers Market on July 29th and at the Columbia City Farmers Market on August 16th. All right, first and foremost, big shout out to Caesar Canizales for, you know, getting up there to Powell Barnett Park. I'm saying you're from the Central District, man. How, how do you feel about this plan for them to take that green space that's right next to the picnic tables and then they kind of fence it off and then there'll be an off the leash dog park inside the park? <laughs> I have a couple feelings. Number one, I do love dogs, like 100%. Dogs are great. <clears throat> Number two, that park is near and dear to me. That's the dunkables park, right? Mm -hmm. When we couldn't dunk, you were able to lower those hoops. <laughs> Vertically jump challenge. Dunk. Yeah. We were like four or five, and, you know, you <laughs> lower it down to six feet, and all of a sudden you're Michael Jordan, right? Uh, but also, that park is a place where a lot of us congregate. You know, when we lose a friend or family member, we yeah. come right there where they're making that dog park. Right. We come there and we celebrate life. To, to be honest with you, the, the parks, especially um, Powell Barnett and Jimi Hendrix, also became a place for repass. Mm -hmm. You know, after, you know, unfortunately, all these these funerals as people congregate in the parks. That was you know, Caesar talked about the way the different ways the park is used. But you're right. It's a lot of congregation in the parks as well. Yeah, we've been there. And that's where, like, let's say I live in Skyway or something. Mm -hmm. And I want to come see my friends who grew up in the neighborhood with me and I'm sliding through the neighborhood. That's one of the places I will always go by and I might see anybody from somebody's parents to some kids that we might know, you know, uh, I see a lot of friends there. We, that place is special to us. We've been going there since we were going to Rogers. <laughs> Man, Rogers thrift fight. Man. Yeah. <laughs> you know, um, we, I've been to family reunions at that park. Um, as kids, we all played in that park before the castle was there, <laughs> you know. So um, my ultimate thought is if you're going to build something in that neighborhood, you should definitely check with the people that hold legacy there and get their opinion. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I mean, Powell Barnett's legacy is still strong. You see uh... – the, the the Barnett family, they're mm -hmm. like, hey, you know, uh, Powell Barnett's uh, name rings bells in, in our community. And we'll see. I mean, you know, Seattle Parks Department, as you saw there in that segment, they have um, open comment. And that's one of the things I would encourage people to do, no matter how you feel about this or other issues, man. The public comment, man, is, you know, you get your opinion on the record. So, yeah. All right. Well, good stuff. And you guys, you can re- uh, relive that segment there across any of our converged media platforms. It's up right now. Feel free to comment. Let us know what your thoughts are about Powell Barnett Park and the proposed dog park in the park. We're going to take a quick break right now. But when we come back, 
do, 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 do. <laughs> Mr. Director, there he is. <laughs> hey, Dr. Eric Chow from Public Health, Seattle King County. And yep, we're talking about COVID, but it's a conversation that we need to have. You're watching The Day with Trey. The new COVID-19 updated booster provides the best protection available right now. So don't wait. Stay safe this summer and get your updated booster today. To find a free vaccine provider near you, go to kingcounty.gov forward slash vaccine. Hailed as a 1776 worth celebrating. What will it take to get two dozen powerfully passionate individuals to settle their differences as they hold the future of our nation in their hands? Direct from Broadway, this is 1776. August 2nd through 6th. Tickets available at fifthavenue.org. Hi, I'm Chelsea Richardson, spoken word artist. Come be a part of Poetry's Love Story and join us for a captivating fundraiser event, Poetry Love, on August 9th from 6 to 9 p.m. at the Sankofa Theater. This event will feature an incredible lineup of renowned poets and one mesmerizing musician, all coming together to raise funds for the Sankofa Theater. Tickets are available now at sankofatheaterc.com. We'll see you there. All right, welcome back to The Day with Trey. I'm your fill-in host for today, the big O, back on the set. It really feels good to be here. Big shout out to our director, uh, Curtis Delgado II. The Cuddy is back there making it happen. All right, so back with a real serious part of conversation, want to welcome Dr. Eric Chow, who's from Public Health, Seattle King County, the, you know, the chief of communicable, communicable bu- 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 diseases <laughs> and epidemiology. Welcome. Thank you so much. It's a real privilege to be here. All right. Good stuff. So before we jump into this conversation about COVID, maybe you can kind of briefly, because the title is really long, so I'm assuming the explanation might be long, <laughs> but you, you can tell people, <laughs> what do you do over at Public Health? Oh, sure. Yeah, I know there's a lot of words in that title. So um, I, I guess in short, basically, uh, what uh, I work with the team that oversees the notifiable conditions caused by infectious diseases in King County, including COVID-19. Uh, and I also happen to work with the immunizations team, which helps with our vaccination strategy to help identify gaps, help increase vaccination rates for vaccine preventable diseases, again, like COVID-19. Yeah, so it all comes back to COVID, doesn't yeah. it? <laughs> <Indeed>. <laughs> all, all roads lead. Well, I mean, so speaking of that, right, and what, one of the things we witnessed here in like the last three weeks was um, what, what people like to say is sort of maybe a recovery in downtown Seattle. I mean, you had all-star and then right after that, you know, you had Taylor Swift and the Toronto Blue Jays came to town, which also packs out T-Mobile Park. You've got people like, you know, this was this was the first time in a long time really being downtown. Of course, where our studios are here that you were like, man, this kind of feels like it's back to normal. All that to say is where where are we at right now with COVID-19? Yeah, well, you know what? Uh, the number of people coming into the city uh, to attend uh, Taylor Swift concerts and other great activities is certainly a sign that things are evolving. Uh, we've certainly come a long way from where we were at the height of the COVID-19 pandemic. And so I think a couple of important takeaways. Now, since the beginning of 2023, um, a number of different measures that we use to uh, assess the number of severe infections, like hospitalizations, deaths, have actually decreased uh, since the start of the new year. Uh, and, uh, and there's a number of indications that are particularly encouraging about where we are relative to where we were in the COVID-19 pandemic. But I wanna make a couple important points here because uh, even though hospitalizations and deaths are decreasing, they're still occurring. And one of the things that I feel like we really don't talk about enough is long COVID. 
those long-term complications that affect people after infection. And long COVID doesn't really seem to care whether you're at high risk for severe disease. It can happen even after people who, are, uh, who had asymptomatic or mild infection. So those are the things that we're really looking out for. So we try to tell people the things that we uh, done during the pandemic to keep ourselves safe are still actually relevant right now. Right. And what is the, the latest information now on the vaccine and on boosters? Um, yeah, I, I'll be honest with you, as a member of the general public, for a while there, it just got very confusing. And it was like, you know, here's if you get here's a booster that does this and here's this and that. Like um, just real honest feedback is that everything was very on message and then when these different variations of like oh and here's for this strain you'll get this and this and that i think a lot of the general public was like man bro this is a lot so where, where are we at now with the vaccine and with boosters great uh i appreciate you bringing up this topic because i think COVID 19 vaccines remains a really relevant topic right now and uh, I acknowledge that uh, there is a lot of like updates to recommendations, and that can be certainly really confusing. And so I want to highlight a couple points. One is, is that one of the greatest scientific feats that we were able to achieve during the pandemic was the development of highly effective and safe vaccinations that we were then able to distribute out into the community. And here in King County, I'm particularly proud because we centered equity in all our activities, working with a number of different organizations, trusted community partners and leaders to help get vaccines to the uh, to people to address uh, historic disparities and inequities to healthcare access. And we had this ambitious goal of achieving 70% completion rate of the primary vaccine series. And due to the hard work across a number of different uh, leaders and organizations, we were able to not only achieve it, but exceed that. Uh, in fact, greater than 85% of residents in King County have completed their primary vaccine series. But we know that the uh, virus has an incentive to evolve and try to evade our immune system, right? And so we have to pivot and update our vaccine to keep up with the virus. So as such, uh, we've developed um, the, uh, there's a new vaccine that's been available since last September, the updated bivalent vaccine uh, that we've been encouraging people to get because it also targets the most recent circulating virus that's been in our community, and that is Omicron. So we lag. Uh, I think we, we've had a lot of success early on during the pandemic, but currently where we are with the updated bivalent booster is not where we would like to see. Only 34% of our community is up to date with recommended vaccines. And we're seeing disparities, um, it, particularly in, in the Black community. We saw uh, early on a lot of enthusiasm for the vaccine. Up to 80% um, of people had completed their primary vaccine series but less than 20% currently are up to date with their um, uh, bivalent vaccine that's been available. So those are the things that we're really concerned about. Yeah, um, you know, for, for sure. Like COVID is, man, it's on the move in the sense that like it, it keeps, it kept like, oh, the word, this, that you guys know how to stop this now? Now let me figure a way around it and everything else. So I guess, um, Vigilance is important in, in your business. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, one of the things that we've learned um, so well about COVID is, is that it throws us curveballs. Mm -hmm. You know, people ask us frequently, what do you think is going to happen in a couple of weeks or next month? It's so hard to pinpoint, right? Because there, is, uh, there are these new variants that come out, people's behaviors change, and that all influences where what direction we head in with the COVID-19 pandemic. Right. So let's talk about masks. Like, see, uh, you know, masks in mask, I think even more than the vaccine was created. It, it was it was it was so political around the mask. You know, I mean, it was something simple, but it was very political in the sense. I mean, do people need to be wearing masks or do they still need to wear a mask or is this, some, you know, I mean, it's weird. Sometimes I'm on the airplane and somebody's wearing a mask and they're just minding their own business. And somebody's like, Oh man, you're still wearing a mask. What's wrong? You know, I mean, is it personal preference? I mean, I know there's no legal mandates anymore, but right. I mean, as a, as a medical professional, what's your stance on the mask? 
Well, let me tell you what I do and what I tell my family and friends. You know, during the COVID-19 pandemic, we've acquired a lot of new knowledge about respiratory viruses, uh, which COVID is one, right? And we also know uh, we've actually um, developed these new tools and uh, uh, acknowledge these new tools that we can start to integrate into our regular activities that we know will protect against COVID-19, which continues to cause infections in our communities and other respiratory viruses. So things like masks, I feel like still really have um, an important place in preventing infections in the first place. And I know a lot of people, especially during the summertime, are looking forward to travel again, being in public spaces, uh, seeing other uh, individuals that they haven't seen for a long time. Um, and likely in their travels, they're gonna be in these indoor public spaces, right? And so um, in those situations, I think that uh, masks are really important because uh, you don't have good air circulation, say on a plane or an airport. A lot of people are coming and going. You don't know who's infected. And the last thing you want to do it, during a vacation is spend it sick. So um, I always bring with me a well-fitting, high-quality mask with me. And in those spaces that you just described, I'm probably one of those people that's sitting there trying to mind my own business and also wearing a mask. So, so you, you want people getting heckled? <laughs> so far, I haven't been heckled. But <laughs> <laughs> um, so in the in the coming months, I know that you said that it's you know it's hard to predict around like uh, the the virus and directions that it go. But in a general sense. I mean, what can we be expecting either about the virus, which is hard to track or public health efforts? Yeah, so much has changed. Right. Um, and, uh, you know, again, we're in a far different place now than we were at any other period during the pandemic. But we have these new tools that are really important for us to continue to integrate into our daily activities, as I mentioned. And one of the first steps that I would certainly advise to anyone who asked me my opinion about COVID is getting the updated um, and staying up to date with recommended vaccinations. Now, the one thing I think I can say for sure is, is that COVID continues to circulate and cause infections every day in our communities. What I'm most concerned about are those longer term complications that we know very little information about right now, but we know can affect people of all ages. Doesn't matter if you're if you're healthy, you're an athlete. I've seen some people in our clinics that come in and were running marathons and suddenly not able to do anything because of their infection. And so I urge vigilance and you know not throw caution into the wind just yet. Yeah, and speaking of vigilance, not throwing caution in the wind, um, a lot of people feel like COVID's over. Um, and like I said, the, being here in, in Seattle and in King County, you know, I mean, that's kind of a legitimate feeling in a sense, you know, because, um, like I said, we're one of the, as a big city in America, we, we suffered some of the, the lowest impact because of things the guys did to keep transmission low and vaccines and everything else. So it's kind of easy to have that sense of like, man, COVID, you know, it's over. Let's move on. And people want to move on, like in so many different ways, right? We want to recover. And I really don't think that somebody who feels like COVID is over, you know, I'm not saying you villainize them or things like that, but they shouldn't, they shouldn't, I don't think people should be looked at like in a bad way because it's like for, for some people, even if it wasn't a health tragedy, it might have been like a financial tragedy. I know so many black business owners who lost their business. They never recovered. They want COVID to be over. I know so many people who lost family members, you know what I'm saying? And weren't there to be able to at least say goodbye. They want COVID to be over. Um, you know, the even just the vibrancy of our city and things that were there, they want COVID to be over. And so when people are like, man, is, is COVID over yet? Or are we moving over to COVID? I just preface that because that's something that, that you're up against when you're saying like, well, we need to be diligent that you have to also like government, because even though you're in public health, you're government, government wants the public to be like, okay, this is what's going on. We want you to understand and trust and everything else. But, but government also has to understand where the public is coming from and their concerns about things. So I say all that to say this, what do you have to say to someone who's like, man, is COVID over? Yeah, that's really a, a, certainly a tough situation and some things that uh, we're continuing to work on in terms of messaging and trying to highlight, um, you know, the importance of, you know, 
uh, COVID-related precautions while also acknowledging just the other impacts that are outside the science, outside the health issues that have also affected people and people would just want to move on. And, you know, part of our goal of the messaging is really to highlight that, you know, COVID-19 continues to ha uh, be a risk. It's continued to circulate in our communities, but I also acknowledge that people need to move on and get on with their lives, right? But the fortunate thing is, is that throughout the pandemic, we have these tools that we know that we can now integrate. You were talking about washing your hands earlier, right? And I talk about these things that small things, small steps that we were doing during the pandemic that can now be integrated into our daily activities that can continue to protect us while allowing us to engage in those activities that we once enjoyed. So, um, you know, the reality is COVID is still circulating. Um, there's still a risk. Uh, and we can do activities that we once enjoyed still safely by taking those elements that we learned. You know, if, if you told someone, for example, washing your hands, right? Washing your hands once upon a time, most people didn't understand the value of that. But now people do that more often uh, than they were previously, similar to masks and the importance of vaccines. These are things we want to carry over and integrating into what we do. Mm -hmm. I know for me, one of the things that if there was a carryover from COVID outside of takeaway drinks from the restaurant, <laughs> that, listen, let me tell you, <laughs> if we want to put a silver lining on COVID, the fact that you could take your drink, it felt like New Orleans, other places it was over. You go in to get you a drink and be on your way walking down the street. But uh, one carryover that, um, that I'd like to see is the sense of caring and the sense of humanity that, you know, not only here in our city, but across our country and around the world, that, that people had an emphasis on, let me look out for somebody else. Let me take care of somebody else. It forced people to think about populations that aren't often thought about. Man, how, how is this group of people going to get food? How are we going to do this thing? And we saw, we saw a city, we saw a government, we saw organizations step up, whether it was like, man, we need to make transportation free or here's, you know, here's food vouchers, make sure people get food or here's how we can, we can just care about each other. And, you know, um, as we go through these transition phases, when we talk about things carrying over, man, I hope that the humanity was on display at its highest level during at times during the pandemic. And I hope that that's something can carry over. You know? Yeah. And thanks for highlighting that. That's such a critical piece that um, we, you know, the work during the pandemic, uh, the work that we did as a public health department, working and engaging with community partners, people who are so enthusiastic about um, these uh, new vaccines that were coming out that were going to help the communities, help turn the tide on what was happening. And that momentum, I really hope that we can ca carry over, not just for COVID-19, but to all diseases, right? And those are elements that are really critical and really are reliant on um, uh, proper funding um, from the uh, federal governments to ensure that we at local health jurisdictions can continue to partner with uh, community members and um, are addressing the issues that they're facing every day. And so again, this is something that, uh, yes, important for COVID, but applies to all of public health. All right, Dr. Eric Chow. Thank you so much uh, for joining us and uh, make sure and pass my regards to everybody over there at Public Health. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. All right. We're going to take a quick break right now. When we come back, the day with Trey continues. I went through a program called Anew. They provided us with tools, transportation. They helped out with um, gas cards. My goal is to journey out with my company and then go into underwater welding. I get the opportunity to do home projects because I'm learning a life skill. This is something that can build a future for you, can build a future for your family. Good things come to those that work for their things. Visit the link at the end of this video to learn more. The new COVID-19 updated booster provides the best protection available right now. So don't wait. Stay safe this summer and get your updated booster today. To find a free vaccine provider near you, go to kingcounty.gov forward slash vaccine. Hailed as a 1776 worth celebrating. What will it take to get two dozen powerfully passionate individuals to settle their differences as they hold the future of our nation in their hands? Direct from Broadway, 
This is 1776. August 2nd through 6th. Tickets available at fifthavenue.org. Hi, I'm Chelsea Richardson, spoken word artist. Come be a part of Poetry's Love Story and join us for a captivating fundraiser event, Poetry Love, on August 9th from 6 to 9 p.m. at the Sankofa Theater. This event will feature an incredible lineup of renowned poets and one mesmerizing musician, all coming together to raise funds for the Sankofa Theater. Tickets are available now at sankofatheaterc.com. We'll see you there. Hey, I'm Basil Gordon. You may have heard my voice on Hits 1061 or seen me on Converge Media, but now I'm coming to TV. I'm hosting the newest show on Fox 13 called Back to Basa. Check us out every weekend for the hottest topics, interviews, the latest trends, and uplifting stories. We're going to have so much fun, and teens, we got you too. Back to Basa Saturday nights, 1030 on Fox 13, and Sundays at 10 a.m. on Fox 13 Plus. No, 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 no. Oh, we really were coming up. <laughs> All right. Hey, so look, before there you saw right there, our very own base of Gordon. You're good, man. Just go, you, you want to pop on? No, you're all right, man. Do you? There's Eric. You know, Eric's multi-talented, man. So he'd be moving around. Plus, he got lots of energy. But uh, Basa Gordon, you might have seen her this morning over on um, Studio Live on Channel 13. Definitely rise a star, our pop culture queen of Converge. You can catch her show Back to Basa there on Fox 13 Saturday at uh, 10.30 p.m. And Sunday at 10 a.m. Uh, the show's so nice, they play it twice. Anyways, uh, man, this is her first month on air over there at Fox. And she took a second to kind of look back on the month of July. Can you believe it? It hasn't even been one month since the launch of Back to Besa on July 1st. Dude, it has already been an epic ride. And I am talking about everything from uplifting black mental health with the Therapy Fund Foundation to celebrating 50 years of hip hop at Basecamp Studios. I chopped it up with my big homie real estate developer, Jebediah Gardner, on how to build generational wealth. Got Pier 62 at Waterfront Park popping at the Converge All-Star Takeover. Speaking of All-Star, your girl hosted the official All-Star Red Carpet and killed it. I went to the Woodland Park Zoo twice, once with my buddy DJ Trunks and again with my media fam, Shantae, Tyra, and Jay. Was on a boat with the Maldonados for the Medium's Collective Fashion Show on Lake Union. Oh, and there is more. My name was up in lights at the iconic Paramount Theater. Supported the young ladies from Softball Beyond Borders in the RBI West Regional Championship. Celebrated soul on the water with my fellow queen of Converge and good sis Trey Holiday. Uplifted Lamar Thompson from aisle four at Field Day in the South End. Shouted out the Seattle Kraken's first black draft pick. Uplifted some really dope artists. Hit the ground running with Jeezy Radio over at the Vera Project. Met Faith Ayub, a 14-year-old podcaster repping the Tulalip Nation. Caught a vibe at the South Sound Music Fest. Uplifted black business at the Bite of Seattle. And who could forget the historic HBCU Swing Man Classic. Man, that was a lot for us to only be one month in. But best believe we're just getting started. I just want to say thank you for all of your support. And remember, you can catch Back to Besa every Saturday at 10.30 p.m. on Fox 13, Sunday at 10 a.m. on Fox 13 Plus, and online at fox13seattle.com. Yo, safe to say, Eric, Besa Gord's been on the grind. Always. <laughs> yeah, I mean, she's a... Uh... She's working, you know. I, I always joke, you know, it's all this big time stuff now. You know, the <laughs> Paramounts is over there, the All Star Game, the Red Carpet. I'd be like, look, Mesa, you know, we got the archives but <laughs> 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 from three years ago. But she's, I mean, it's just, it's amazing to see how she's developed from just coming on. She come on the morning update show for like, you know, two minute update, 
on what's happening with Gorilla Goo Girl. Yeah. <laughs> you, know, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> so now this, and I mean, it's, it's just a testament to her commitment and her hard work. Man, I've known Besa for so long. And when I can say since the moment I met her, maybe 10, 15 years ago, she has had this dream and she has been working towards it piece by piece, inch by inch, every step of the way, fighting through life and everything to see her up to where she's at now. If you're somebody from Seattle, you just need to be proud if you know her. You just got to smile and be like, oh, my God. That's a shining example of somebody who is actually taking the time to walk in their purpose no matter what life has thrown at them, and you get to see it pay off. Shouts out to Besa, man. <laughs> Shouts out to Besa. Hey, man. <laughs> CD or see me. CD or see me. <laughs> <laughs> hey, listen. I mean, was was really was really dope too. Just saw that. I know we got to wrap the show here. It was big O, so you know we was going long. Uh, <laughs> one thing I'll say here is that you know a lot of times what our young people have to look up to coming coming out of the central district is you know it's athletes and entertainers which are dope by the way all of you um but so it's really good for for young people and especially young girls to be able to say like man you know this is the same neighborhood and you know and here's basa and believe me like her she's she's just getting started so yeah she's only just getting started that's for sure all right so for it what do you have for tomorrow uh, so tomorrow I got my good friend Justin coming on to give us a little bit of fashion tips. Uh, oh man, that's what I need. Can we put me up <laughs> on the camera there, Curtis. <laughs> Justin, uh, I'm like two X and like a thirty eight, <laughs> and a twelve in the shoes. So yeah, tell tell me if we don't come with nothing, then we ain't letting them in. <laughs> I got you. <laughs> All right, everybody. Look, we're going to get out of here, man. Thanks for tapping in with us today on the day with Trey. Um, man, and, and Trey, Trey's in Egypt, man. I don't even know if she, <laughs> she's, gonna she's come back. back in Africa, man. I don't know if she's <laughs> ever coming back. <laughs> but, Trey, if, if you tapping in over there, man, you know what I'm saying? You see, we're still having fun here on the set. <laughs> on, on that note, man, have a wonderful day. Go forward in your purpose. Go forward in your humanity. Until tomorrow at 11 a.m. Peace. Peace. Converge Media produces culturally relevant content for Black and urban audiences. Our coverage is raw, transparent, and objective. Praised by community leaders, government officials, and residents. Support Converge Media today via Venmo, Cash App, or PayPal at Converge Media.